Hi, this is Professor Cummings, and I want to do a video here about the power rule. And one thing about this video that's odd is I actually did a whole series, or a very small series, but one of my earliest series on my channel was on derivatives. And I thought that I had done a video on the power rule. It turns out I didn't do it. There was like two videos that I was missing in my list though that I thought I had taken care of. So what I want to do is go back and do this video because I think it's going to be useful to uh, students in my class. And what I'm going to do is go off and you know do a little bit of a reminder as to what a derivative is actually and then I'm going to show uh, how to use the power rule. So Let's start off with the definition of what a derivative. Again, this will be a review. You can look through this series uh, on my channel if you, you can skip past this first few minutes. But it might be good for just to, to get a review on it. So some de definitions of a derivative is a rate of change of a function with respect to an independent variable. All right, so that's an important thing to keep in mind that it is with respect to an independent variable. Another definition uh, it's the slope of a line at a tangent point of a function. Another definition, it depicts a rate of change. Another very important definition and, you know, several things that you can have that are going to go through a rate of change. And this is just one of our, you know, pressure, temperature, uh, position are all just examples of things that go through a rate of change. It's a little more technical definition. Uh, limit of a function approaches zero. Or the limit as a function approaches zero. And this is the mathematical interpretation of, of that last definition. And we'll go through this one a little bit more into a little bit more detail. But like I said, you know, this other one, which is the rate of change with an independent variable, is what you can look at here. So you can see pressure, temperature, even things like volume, which, you know, when you're looking at it with respect to uh, uh, time, is flow rate. And look, here we got a graphical representation. You know, here you have a function, and you have the independent variable and the dependent variable. For the most part, this independent variable is time. So we usually depict that as time, and then we've got some other variable we're doing it with. Uh, that's actually with respect to time. But this could be, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be time. It's just the one that, that typically uh, happens when we talk about derivatives and, you know, in physics and most things along those lines. So it's you, more times than not, it will be about a time. So what I want to look at is the difference between an instantaneous rate of change versus an average rate of change. Again, another very important concept which gets us to derivatives. So when we think about derivatives, if we were to just look at this graph and say this x-axis, again, we'll call this time. And we've got this y-axis here, and we'll say this is some type of displacement or distance. All right, we can actually graph the behavior of whatever body we're talking about with respect to time. So as it goes through a certain amount of time, we can start to see where that body is in terms of its distance. Now, if we were to try to understand what's going on on an average, let's say you're driving in a car and I wanted to figure out where you, what your average speed was between two particular points in that, in that car. You know, I could say, okay, at point A, you know, since that's a function, you had traveled to a certain distance of f of a, so a function of a. Now, that will be our starting point. That would be where we're going to first say we're going to try and find out where your, your, your average velocity or average speed was as we went through that time. Now, let's say we have another point in time we're looking at, you know, that we're trying to work it through. So we'll say we go out a distance or out a h amount of time so we travel the distance a to h or here we have a plus h and we can see where we're going to be based on that function of the line what that new displacement is going to be 
and that'll be f of a plus h, a function of a plus h. All right, now if we wanted to find out what the average velocity was, you know, kicking this as a distance versus time, we wanted to find out what the average was, the average rate of change, what we could do is just take the slope of a line that collects to those two points. So a difference in the y axis over the difference in the x axis or the rise over the run, right? The rise going up versus the run going along the x axis. And that relationship gives us a rate of change or the slope of that line. Now, if we put everything in terms of a and h, we want to find out what that slope is in terms of a and h, as well as uh, functions of a and h, we have to use a slightly different one. So we've got this particular point, which represents, or the difference between these two points, which represents our rise, and the distance between a and a plus h, those two points, which are going to represent our run, we can make the equation like this. So what we have, that slope of that line, is f of a plus h minus f of a, function of a, over, here we have a plus h minus a, or that comes down to just h. So this would represent, based off of these terms that we're using here, represents what the average rate of change of that function between those two points. What this doesn't tell us is what may have been going on here. You know, when you're in that car, you know, you may have actually slowed down. You may have sped up. All we know is that these two points, as it crosses that function, the secant of the line, is actually uh, uh, what that average is going to be. Now, that's different from our instantaneous rate of change. Right, so let's take that same function, right? And it's still time. And this is still distance. But now we want to know exactly what's happening somewhere on that line at any instant, at any instant. And what that means is we're no longer looking at A plus H and A we're narrowing this distance down, or this range of time, as close to zero as we can possibly get it. So hence, we're trying to get to an instant in, in time. All right, so we're driving that, that displacement, or I keep calling it displacement, trying to put that span of time as close to zero, or as close to an instance as possible. All right, so what we're gonna end up with is a point on that line, a point on that function. And that tangent point to that function, because we only want to intersect in one spot, this is what's known as the derivative. It kind of goes back to our earlier definitions on the last slide. So that dy over dx on this line, which would be the slope of the line, but the, notice it's not a delta, it's a lowercase d, which is our differential. So, the, you know, the instant of y and the instant of x. So that, uh, this brings us to this different equation. Notice it's the differential of y with respect to the differential of x versus the delta y over the delta x, because we're trying to narrow that time down to zero. And we've got this limit as h is driven to zero. So this h is getting as small as possible. It's going to an, an instant in time. But we're still looking at the rise versus the run. So that is why we call this one a derivative. So this is how that derivative is, is being uh, described. So we're driving that, that span of time down to almost zero to the point where it is an, a tangent point to the line. The line that can be drawn through that is a tangent point to this, this function, excuse me. And that is what we're calling a derivative. So it's that instantaneous rate of change versus an average rate of change. All right. So we're looking at the change in distance versus time. It's equal to velocity. In this instance of a derivative, it's a differential of distance with respect to time. So that gives us our instantaneous velocity of that function. Now, if we were to try and use this formula, we could actually calculate 
the derivative, we know what that function is. The mathematical function that this, or mathematical equation describes this function of this line. Now let's say that this uh, equation is x squared, right? So if you're input at any point in time in x to figure out what's going on with y, you just square x and that tells you what f of x is. So that's how you can figure out what your distance is. So we can use this equation to kind of walk through that. So we're still talking about the slope of a line at a tangent point of that function. So f of x is equal to y, which is the y-axis, which is x squared. So using our equation that we know how to, that we're going to get that instantaneous rate of change. You can go ahead and plug that x of or x squared or put everything in terms of x. So we got the function of x is x squared here. And we have uh, f of x plus h over h. We do all of our substitutions. You know, so we you know, uh, foil this out. We end up with x squared plus h squared plus 2xh minus x squared over h. So now we're going to start simplifying things down. As you can see right off the bat, we're going to drop our parentheses and our x squares are going to be eliminated. They're going to cancel each other out. Here we can factor out the h. So now we have h times the quantity of h plus 2x. So these are going to cancel each other as well. All right, so we'll move up to here. So now we've got this new equation. Remember, we're looking at the limit as h approaches 0. So this one's going to go away as well. And we end up with the derivative. And that's what this prime is telling us. This is the derivative. The derivative of f of x, or the derivative of this particular function, is going to come out to be 2x. Right? So the tangent point, the slope of the tangent point, so we're going to draw that in here, is going to be a function of 2x. So that'll, that'll be what describes that the slope of that line at that instantaneous point. So that is what gets us the, uh, the derivative of that, of that line, or the, excuse me, of that function. Now let's look at something else. So, so you see this, this is a pretty cumbersome way of handling that, uh, being able to look at that particular function and try to walk all the way through that. Now there's a much more easy way to do this that I wanted to walk through. I want you to keep in mind what we're, we're looking at here. We're looking at the function and we're looking at its derivative. You know, so x squared and its derivative is 2x. Now let's look at a, a much simpler way of handling this. And that simpler way of handling that is known as the power rule. And the power rule is, is as simple as, it's just simply saying, okay, we have a function of x, which is equal to x to the nth power. And its derivative is going to be n times x raised to the n minus 1. Or you bring down its exponent and make it a coefficient, and then you subtract 1 from the original exponent. And it really is just that simple to do the power rule. So if we were to look at our original function, where f of x is equal to x squared, which described the function in our last slide, and we use that power rule on that, we just take down the exponent, and make it a coefficient, which will make that 2x, subtract 1, and we end up with x to the first power, or you can just write that as x, because the 1 is implied, which would make it 2x. So you can see, instead of going through that entire equation that we had looked at originally, we've got this power rule, which basically takes us through that equation as a shortcut. So here we have our function you know, of x squared, and our, its derivative is 2x. So let's look at another example. And it'd be a very simple example here. And what we have is the function of x is x to the 10th. Again, we use the same power rule. You know, again, you know, bring the exponent, make it a coefficient, which should make that 10x. And then subtract 1 from the original exponent, which should make that 9. So that is 
the power rule, but there, what if we have a little more complicated uh, type of a, an example that we could use? Something a little more complicated, right? Yes, use a staying power rule where we have a equation where we have x raised to some power plus x plus 2. You know, how do we handle that? Well, there is a certain rule about derivatives that's pretty easy. The power rules apply to each term, all right? And there's this little note here. The, the derivatives of the sum is equal to the sum of the derivatives. What that basically means is you can go through each term in this equation and take each one of its derivatives, and that will give you the derivative of the entire sum. So just going through and applying the power rule on each term independently is what takes us and gets us our derivative of that whole function. So let's work this through. So you see this particular equation, we take the derivative of each, or apply the power to each term. So we take the exponent down, make that n times x raised to the n minus one. The next one's gonna be, since this is a one implied, you know, that basically comes down and then it's exponent minus, or one minus one, which uh, raises it to zero. That makes that a one so you're just left with the coefficient and then the derivative of a constant goes to zero and that's what we're looking at down here that's the derivative of the first term the derivative of the second term and if we want to put that in there the derivative of the third term the constant goes to zero and this is what this simplifies to so n times x to the n minus one plus one so let's look at an actual example with actual numbers, no variables in there, and just to kind of drive it home. So we got this number, or this this function here, where x raised to the 5 halves plus 3x plus 4. Let's take its derivative. Again, remember, the derivative of the sum is equal to the sum of the derivative. So we're just going to take the derivative using the power rule of each term. So if we consider that, we take the original exponent off of the first one and we make that the coefficient. Then we subtract one from the exponent, which is two over two. We need a common denominator. You have the second one, you know, the three of the coefficient stays put. You know, we have a implied one here. So we'll multiply that times three, leaves that alone. And then we subtract one from the original exponent, one minus one, and again four, since the constant goes to zero. So we do our simplification, and we end up with five halves times x raised to the three halves plus three. So this is the derivative of this. All right, so this is Professor Cummings, and that's all I wanted to go through. Uh, I'll be going through a other rule or another rule of taking derivatives I want you to, to learn. But you want you to keep one thing in mind. All these other rules depend on that product rule. You know, once you know the product rule, all the other rules kind of follow through on that one. So just keep in mind, you know, master this product rule, which is fairly simple, fairly easy to master. And you'll start applying it in all these different ways. And you'll end up with things such as the quotient rule, the product rule and other types of ways of finding the derivatives. So this is Professor Cummings, and uh, thanks for watching. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Uh, go ahead and share if this video might be helpful to other people. Uh, and again, thanks for watching and subscribe for, for other videos.